right, biomechanics. Let's see if we can uh, clarify some things, make sure we're all on the same page, okay? So I'm gonna start off with a little story. And this story deals with Newton's third law, which we're gonna get into in more detail. You guys have been introduced to this in physics. Uh, action reaction is the, the, key, the little key word for it. But when I was teaching a, a, a class, uh, when I was at Auburn, I could tell right away that there was a um, misunderstanding of what that law really means. It's not that the law is wrong. It's our understanding and applicability of the law could use some clarity. So <clears throat> we were doing these, uh, these force diagrams on the board and you know, person leans up against the wall and obviously that brick wall isn't going anywhere, right? And the question was, apply Newton's third law of action reaction to this scenario. And a student, and student was being wise. It was a great question. Said, I don't understand how Newton's third law can be applied to the person in the wall because neither of them are moving. And I followed that up with, well, why do you have to move to apply Newton's third law? And the student wisely said, because action assumes movement. You know, when you're acting, you know, imagine the director, ready and action, move, do something. You don't say action and everything stands still. So even back then I could see how there's a fog there's a cloudiness over forces and action. Now, what Newton's third law is trying to say is that the person is applying a force to the wall. The person is trying to move the wall. That wall's not going anywhere. The wall thus tries to move the person. Now, sometimes the wall can move the person. It, that's an option, but it's not the only option. Like if the guy runs into the wall, boom, the wall is gonna slow the dude down and speed the guy up. So the wall can do work on the person, but it doesn't have to. If the guy's just leaning up against the wall, no motion is needed for them to be trying to move each other. And so the real thing is that Newton's third law is, is, is about forces. The guy is trying to move the wall and the wall is trying to move the guy. Neither of them are going anywhere. What a great analogy for isometric contraction. If, if we were doing something similar where I was, let's just for the sake of this example, if I was on a, a seated chest press machine to try to create a similar example. And let's say I'm halfway through the motion, I just stopped and just held that position for a little while. The machine is trying to move my hand and then my shoulder and my elbow this way. I am trying to move the machine that way, but yet there's no action, there's no motion. There's contraction, there's work, there's isometric contraction. I am trying to push the handle forward. The handle is trying to push my hand back. So action is a confusing word because it, you know, Pavlov ring the bell, you salivate. It makes us instinctually think there must be motion and there doesn't have to be motion. I have muscles right now working in my cervical. I taught you guys this in 310, cervical extensors. They are working isometrically to prevent my head from falling forward. They're working, they're doing a job. But if I said the action of the cervical extensors is cervical extension or to produce cervical extension or to extend the cervical vertebra, then that could be confusing for some people because you could say, well, how can they be doing a job when I don't see this? That's how. Just because the muscles are trying to extend you doesn't mean they're always going to. Just because a batter is trying to get a hit 
doesn't mean they are always going to get a hit. Can you imagine? I know this is semantics. I'm going to bring it up, but, but now's a good segue. The purpose of a batter is to try to hit the ball. Because if the purpose was to hit, you'd fail 70% of the time, right? It's to try to hit because that infers variable outcomes. Sometimes you do get a hit while trying to get a hit. Sometimes you strike out while trying to get a hit. Sometimes you walk. Sometimes you have all these different outcomes. But by saying try, you encapsulate all the different outcomes. Same thing with contractions and muscles. When you say a muscle is trying to cause a motion, that encapsulates all the different outcomes. Because sometimes it does cause motion in the direction of pull, concentric. Sometimes it doesn't, isometric or eccentric, right? So it's very important for us to understand that this isn't saying all those textbooks and stuff are wrong. It's just foggy. It's, it's unclear. It adds to the confusion of the purpose of muscles, and that's what this video is for. It's just to try to help us understand what's really happening. Action reaction is happening even though there's no motion. Okay? Let's see what we got here. All right, clarifying verbiage. I'm gonna post this to Moodle. To avoid practical confusion, okay? Motion without contraction is just motion. Duh, but what I mean by that is, if someone is, if someone learns that motion is associated with a certain muscle, what I mean by that is, Flexion is associated with the bicep. The action of the bicep is to have flexion. Well, let's think of some different ways I could have flexion without the bicep. I can have flexion because of my tricep through eccentric work. I can have flexion because of gravity. I could just relax my tricep and let gravity flex me. No muscle is there at all. I could have someone passively do range of motion on me and flex my elbow. My bicep wasn't responsible for that, okay? Motion without contraction is just motion. Motion with contraction is function. That's very important. The function of a muscle is to pull in a certain direction of motion. And when that muscle is working working above rest, doing a job, being innervated above rest, to pull in a certain direction of motion, one of three options can happen. It can cause motion in the direction of pull through concentric contraction. You have to have all those three. You have to have a muscle that pulls in a direction of motion. You have to have an observable motion or no motion if it's isometric. And thus you have the contraction. The contraction has to be part of this equation. That's why we have that basic A plus B is equal to C. Motion with contraction is function. What is the function of the bicep? Well, the function of the bicep is to pull in a direction of flexion. And through concentric work, you're going to observe flexion. But through eccentric work, you're going to observe extension. And through isometric work, you're not going to observe any motion at all. There's function, but there may not be action. Especially with isometrics, right? Look, isometrics. Holding this dumbbell. The bicep is doing a job. It has a function but it doesn't have an action. There's no motion there. So what is its function? Its function is to pull this way so that the weight doesn't fall that way. The function is to pull this way to make the weight go that way. The function is to pull this way to prevent the weight from falling down. That's function, that's a job. What does it do? What's your function? What do you do? What's the function of a policeman? What's the function? of a fireman? What's the function of a nurse? What's the function of a doctor? The action is kind of foggy, okay? 
So I give some examples, what you may find in the book. Now, again, I'm not saying the book is wrong. I'm saying the book can be unclear to the true purpose of muscle function. Okay? Now, some of you will need to learn, eventually, in graduate school, specific origins of muscles, insertions of muscles, uh, innervations of muscles, what nerve innervates. But for an undergraduate biomechanics class, my thought is, what's the most important thing for people to know that encompasses all the different jobs you guys are going to have? Personal trainer, fitness professional, athletic trainer, future therapist, coaches. Do you know what all of those have in common? Not what's the origin of a muscle. The one-third linea aspara of the femur. Coaches won't need a know that. And those of you that will need to know that, you can still learn that when you, when you need to. You know what all of you guys are going to have in common? Function. What do muscles do? How do, I, how, do I, how do I set up an exercise to work a certain muscle or certain muscle groups? Coaches need to know muscles and function. Therapists need to know muscles and function. Athletic trainers need to know muscles and function. Personal trainers need to know muscles and function. The most important thing to, to, to know and apply is what do muscles do? What's their purpose? Okay, so a classic textbook example, book, muscle, brachialis. It's a muscle in your arm. Origin, distal half of anterior surface of the humerus. In our class, we're just going to say, hey, it, it, it originates on the humerus. Insertion, coronoid process and tuberosity of ulna. Hey, guys, it inserts on the ulna. Starts on the humerus, inserts on the ulna. So where do we get function from? That's understanding how it crosses the joint. I'm going to teach you that in our, in our follow-up lecture. What's the action? This is straight from a book. The action flexes the elbow. Oh, really? My tricep just flexed my elbow. How do you explain isometrics? Flex his elbow. So all I'm saying is that we're going to be more clear. We're going to say pulls in the direction of elbow flexion or flexion puller. That's true. It's a flexion puller. It pulls in a direction of flexion, but it's not going to always cause flexion. The batter is not always going to get a hit. And then obviously nerves. So I go over the limitations of the book. It oversimplifies the purpose of muscles. Okay? So if you say action flexes the elbow, you'd have to literally add only through concentric contraction. Only in one scenario. Only 33% of the time of your options. 66, but two-thirds of the time, in terms of your contraction options, you will not observe flexion when the brachialis is doing a job. I hope this is hidden home, okay? So the alternative is, well, there's the baseball analogy, right? Okay? What is the purpose of skeletal muscle? To pull. Well, to pull how? In the direction of motion. Remember in 310, you have as many muscle groups as you have joint motions. You have muscles that pull in every direction of motion. But just because they pull in that direction of motion would be uh, vain to say they are always going to cause motion in those directions of pulls. That's like saying every time you've ever played tug of war, you're going to win. How vain. So muscles pull in the directions of motion, but they're not always going to cause motion in the direction of pull of their motion. Okay? And one of the side effects of this is when you associate muscles with specific motions. Uh, I, I mentioned this on the previous lecture. My friend, Coach Jeff Davis, who passed away a couple years ago, he, it took me 45 minutes to convince him that doing a push-up doesn't work your front and your back muscles. And one of his confusions was when you push yourself up, you're working the chest because that's a certain motion, right? You know, But when you lower yourself down, 
he was saying, no, that's working your lats and your back. And I'm like, coach, that can't work your lats and back. If you'd use those muscles, you'd pull your hands from the ground, you'd fall flat on your face. And his argument was, but Brian, it's the same motion as a row. And I said, well, coach, why are you doing a row when you bring the weight forward? That's the same motion as a push-up. It's not about the motion. I can have flexion because of the bicep, but I could also have flexion because of the tricep. And I can have extension because of the tricep, and I could have extension because of the bicep. It's not just about a muscle and a motion. If you learn it like that, you'll be right one-third of the time. I like to be right more than that, okay? All right, so this is how we are going to learn muscle function, action. You, you could still say action, but I want you to know what that really means. I want you to understand that action means function, that you can have Newton's third law and have no motion. Force, counterforce, okay? In our class, muscle, brachialis, origin, humerus, insertion, ulna. What's the function? What is it trying to do? It's an elbow flexor. Well, what does that mean, an elbow flexor? Does that mean it's always going to be flexion? No. Elbow flexor means a muscle that pulls in the direction of elbow flexion because it crosses the elbow anteriorly, it crosses in the front. So if you have a rope that crosses the elbow in the front and you pull on that rope, you're going to be pulling in a direction of flexion. Think about it. Pulling a hip flexor. We've heard that before, right? Someone pulled a hip flexor. I ironically enough, when you pull a hip flexor, you have extension of your hip because that muscle is working eccentrically, being lengthened while trying to shorten to slow down that hip extension. Isn't that ironic? That you pull a hip flexor by extending. Because the hip flexor isn't about just flexing the hip. It's about pulling that way, and sometimes you do flex it through concentrics, but sometimes you slow down extension through eccentrics. So that's 310 review, okay? So function pulls in the direction of motion. In-depth function, we're going to have flexion when it works concentrically. We're going to see extension when it works eccentrically. And we're going to see no motion when it's working isometrically, preventing the opposite motion to happen, right? My brachialis works isometrically to prevent my elbow from extending. So this is really important. I'm going to try to keep it short uh, because I'd like for you to watch this a couple times. When we the next lecture is going to be cross cross uh, circle uh, cross sectional anatomy, and I'm going to teach you that origin and insertion, although important for some of you, what really dictates function is where does that sucker cross? If the muscle crosses on the outside of my arm, it's going to pull in the dire direction of abduction. If it crosses in the front, it's going to pull in the direction of flexion. For my wrist, if I have a muscle that crosses anteriorly, it's going to pull in the direction of flexion. Uh, uh, posteriorly pull in the direction of extension. So where does a muscle cross is going to be a determinant of its function. How does it pull? Okay. If you have any questions, you let me know. You guys have a great rest of your day.